So I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here. Dumbo, everybody, Karusana. I first came to Tanzania in 1988 when I lived in East Africa. I've been back many times since, but it's a very appropriate place to have the amazing people that have come forward for this meeting. We have ministers of health, we have the Honorable Secretary General of SADAC, as well as the East African Union. We have distinguished first ladies, we have people in the immunization community, people from industry, NGOs. It's really an extraordinary gathering. So what I'm gonna to try to do, as, as you've heard from uh, Flavia, is take you through a little history and then where it is we hope we're going as an alliance. Now, I think it's very appropriate that we're here today and this, that the symbol of what we're doing is a baobab tree. You can see it on the slide, you'll see it on the program and all around. And this is important because this tree has special significance in Africa. It's a tree that's revered. It's a tree where people gather underneath and talk about important issues. It's a tree where people go and talk to their ancestors. And so together, we hope, as you've heard from Dad Finn, we're going to try to use this as a time for us to come together and have important discussions. So although we've changed and although we've grown, and we'll talk about that, our mission has not changed. Saving children's lives and protecting people's health by increasing access to immunization in poor countries. This is a valuable mission. This is what brings us together. This is the decade of vaccines. And at this meeting, we're going to have many discussions on, the, on the, uh, the, the plan that came out of this effort and the exciting accountability framework that is going forward. But we are living in the decade of vaccines, and the work that we do is what makes it the decade of vaccines. So you've already heard, these are the main themes. These were most of the main themes in, in the decade of vaccine report. Um, and these are what we're, we're having the meeting organized around, and these are pre key to what we're trying to do. So let's start with um, the results part of this, because this is an organization, an alliance that values results. So what have we done since 2000? So we've immunized 370 million additional children. This is preventing or more than 5.5 future deaths. This is the DPT-3 vaccine, and you can see the spread of this from its origin until 2007 when it became pentavalent vaccine, and you can see it moving forward. The extraordinary thing is this was seen as a new vaccine and as of 2014, every single Gavi country, all 73, will be using this vaccine. It is a routine vaccine, and that is what we're trying to do. Now, across this time period, immunization has gone up, and I will come back to this later in the talk. But I think what's important is if you look at the launch of Gavi, you can see that the high-income countries kind of stabilized in the mid-1990s, and it really was the launch of Gavi that lifted up the coverage, and you can see the coverage of the world also was lifted up, but it was because of the advances that were made in the low-income world. So this is the first injection of the pneumococcal vaccine given in Nicaragua just a few years ago. And you can see the march going forward of the pneumococcal vaccine. Again, one of the largest killers of children and an extraordinary story in that this vaccine was made available about a year and a half after it was first made available in the West. This is the rotavirus vaccine. And you can see again the march of the rotavirus vaccine going across the Gavi world. Again, the largest cause of childhood diarrhea. Now, we couldn't do this without the support of our donors and what you can see is the extraordinary increase, the quadrupling of resources that donors have made available to drive this incredible alliance. And what's also important is that we had an amazing, amazing event last June in our replenishment conference where the donors raised $7.35 billion of money. 4.3 was new at that moment, 7.35 for this period an extraordinary accomplishment 
in a very, very difficult time. Now, you know, it's what, what are we doing with this money? Take a look at the in increase in volume of vaccines that are procured. So in 2011, 156 million doses of vaccine have been procured. And of course, this is something that is done in, in partnership with um, our, the supply division at UNICEF, who is the procurement agent for the alliance, and the manufacturers who have scaled up to produce this extraordinary quantity of vaccines. And look at the expansion of antigens. We started off with hepatitis B in 2001, and you can see the, the, the many diseases that we're now dealing with. And of course, we have two new ones you heard mentioned before. We're going to be rolling out measles and rubella and the human papillomavirus for cervical cancer next year. Now, of course, you can't do this without having a health system and having health workers. This is absolutely critical to what's happening. It is, after all, the countries that are using these products. And, and we, we put a lot of effort into trying to strengthen health systems. I must say that over the time, we've adjusted our programs to try to meet your needs, because that's what it's about. We're about trying to support the countries, support what they're doing. And I must say, I know this is confusing. I know we haven't gotten it quite right, but we are committed to getting it right. And we will continue to work until we have health systems uh, a support that is absolutely in the bullseye of what you need to do this incredible work. So let's now talk about innovation. This is an extraordinary story. This week in Nigeria, the 100 million person will receive the Meninge vaccine. Now, for all those that haven't been in the meningitis belt, Men, men A was really a terrible disease. People would get um, meningitis in epidemic fashion. Whole villages would get infected. People would be sick. People would die. They would be terrible sequelae. A partnership came together, an innovative partnership coming together of manufacturers like the Serum Institute of India, the Gates Foundation, uh, WHO, HAF. Um, they were able to come together and produce a new vaccine that cost 50 cents a dose. And the challenge was getting it out of here, and there was no shortage of demand. When people heard that there was a vaccine to stop this terrible disease, they lined up. This is an extraordinary accomplishment, and I must say and honor all of the ministers of health of these countries who have facilitated this moving forward. So an example of the type of partnership that we've tried to do. Auto disabled syringes. When Gavi first started, there was huge risk that in, with immunization, a small number of people, of course, it was always safe. It's a rare event, but a small number of people could have had transmitted hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV. And so a program began to have these auto disabled syringes, which are now used in all of Gavi's country. We've been able to change the mindset and have people respect the issue of sterility, because of course in health, primo non nocere, the first do no harm, is the model of the healthcare worker. And we've been able to enable countries to be able to do that. Other innovations, you see on the upper right hand corner here, a vaccine biomonitor, which has been on all vac Gavi uh, vaccines for more than seven years. This is an extraordinary technology that allows the healthcare worker in the field to tell whether the vaccine has been treated properly. And we're beginning to see changes like uh, using SMS to reach patients, better stock management, and the auto-disabled um, uh, syringe on the left there. But it isn't only in technology and vaccines that we've innovated. We've innovated in the financial area as well. The International Finance Facility for Immunization took the novel idea of taking donor commitments, long-term donor commitments, and using capital markets to be able to finance the work. And so far, Gavi has received $2.2 billion from IFM. But as important in places as diverse as Japan and South Africa, people have come forward and bought these bonds. In Japan, they're called vaccine bonds. 
more recently in Japan, and there's a, 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 an insatiable appetite for these because women often make the decision to invest in the household and they want to invest their money in high quality bonds, but in bonds that are gonna make a difference for the world. What an extraordinary partnership. We've also created an innovative partnership. It's difficult sometimes. We sit around table with a, a completely different group of people, sometimes with very different interests, but we discuss the key issues and we come together. And that is the strength of this, is bringing together all the diverse groups, the diverse points of views, towards our shared goals. And this has been a very, very important part of what we've been able to accomplish. Now another key innovation, is hard to target, it's hard to put in a slide, but when I started working in this field, I would have conversations with my pharmaceutical colleagues, and they would talk about high-income countries, the US, Europe, Japan, and they would talk about ROW, that stands for rest of world. This was a fragmented market. It was countries that could or could not pay. They didn't know what was gonna happen. What Gavi has done, and it's very, very important, is it's changed the mindset of industry, not just in the industrial manufacturers, but across the world. Because today, we're talking about bringing these countries together. And what's extraordinary is Gavi actually has more than half of the world's children as a birth cohort. So when we sit down with a company now and discuss a new vaccine, the question is not anymore, well, is that gonna trickle down in a long time? The question is, how do we get those vaccines to those people? What is the mechanism? What is the partnership? How do we create a situation where we can create the volumes from the beginning of the manufacturing and not retrofit it later? This is an extraordinary intervention that will bring value you know, all the way into the future. Never again will a company have a life-saving vaccine and ask the question, you know, well, is this ever going to get to the people who need it? Today, the question is only how and what do we have to do to do that? Let's talk a little bit about sustainability. This is an important part of the program. You can see the growth in countries' co-financing. We believe at Gavi that some countries have adequate finance and some don't. And the ones that don't have adequate finance, we should help. But at the end, everybody should pay for the work that's going on. Everybody should have skin in the game, as we say. And that's a critical part of what it is we're trying to do. So last year, 100% of the Gavi countries supported their vaccines with hard currency, which of course is extremely difficult for many of the countries we're working in. This is important not only because it raises a lot of capital to support the program, but more importantly, it forces a discussion between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Financing and the Ministry of Planning, and perhaps, and in best cases, the head of state. And this is what allows us over time to make this a sustainable program for all of those leaders to understand the value of vaccines, the power of vaccines, and why this is a good investment. With our work, with our pharmaceutical partners, we've been able to get extraordinary reductions in prices. These are the reductions in prices of the rotavirus vaccine. This is the reduction in the price of HPV, and you can see a little dash line down this because the board said we wouldn't open a window unless we could do better on pricing, and our expectation is we will, although we're in a procurement round now. This is important for its long-term sustainability. And here is the reduction in pentavalent and pricing. Now let me emphasize that everybody focuses on price, but to us, the most important thing is a healthy vaccine market. We need to make sure that these products are safe, that these products are able to be available, that there aren't stockouts, that there's healthy competition. You can see here, that um, what Gavi was able to do was shorten the time it took. These, the, the, on this slide are the number of countries being introduced. So you can see that we were able to shorten the time before 50% of the countries got this vaccine. Um, and what's important about this is not only did we do that, but you can see that we were able to bring the vaccine to virtually 100% of the countries, still below that in the wealthy world, uh, sorry, above that in the wealthy world. So, what we've been able to do is deliver even better than the places where these vaccines were initiated. 
Now, this is a, many years ago. I've already mentioned to you today what's been able to occur with pneumococcal vaccine and how quick that's occurred. That's what we're looking for. The ultimate goal would be simultaneous introduction in the North and South. That's what we want. And it's interesting. Um, this is a slide of um, taken from a Save the Children report on equity. It is looking at the difference between wealth, um, the lowest quintile to the highest quintile of wealth, and what you can see is one of the problems we have. Because although we're successful on a macro level globally, what we're not doing is reaching the fifth child, reaching the children who are in most need. And so I think it's, this is a critical priority we'll talk about through the Partners Forum. I know this is a focus of many of our CSO partners, UNICEF, WHO are working hard on trying to do this, but this is where we really have to be measured because we believe every child everywhere should have access to these vaccines. So these are some of the launches that have happened over this period of time, the last six months. And what you'll notice by looking through these is that the, these are some of the most difficult places to work in the world. And that is important because we do not shirk away from difficulty, and it's very important because these children are getting protected. And as I went through there, you saw that North Korea was in there. North Korea not only did a good job, but came up with US dollar capital to be able to pay its co-financing, which shows the dedication of the government to this important effort. But there are huge challenges. I've talked about the challenge of equity. 22 million children in the world are still not fully immunized. This is another challenge in front of us. How do we reach those? And you can see that, that these are in, in, in Gavi countries. India, the largest of these, and of course, India, an extraordinary country, has just um, been able to eradicate polio um, and has, is manufacturing many of the vaccines we're using here in Gavi. So how do we get the Indian government focused on it? And I'm happy to report that emboldened by what they were able to do in polio, India is on the move. Pentavalent is rolling out, they're moving forward with measles, they're talking about um, pneumo and rota, so I think it's going to be an exciting driving point going forward. But again, this is a challenge for all of us to discuss here at the Partners Forum. One of the reasons we have such a hard time is the state of infrastructure and the state of healthcare workers. Here in Tanzania, we heard that only 42% of the health workers that they need are in position. So these are challenges in the health system. And as we strengthen immunization, we strengthen the whole health system. And we strengthen the, the, the work across all of the interventions that are critical to try to save children. This is an example of the data system. The data system is absolutely critical. We have terrible problems with data. Example of cold chain, again, modernizing and work. And in this particular period going forward, UNICEF is going to make a special push working with WHO on the cold chain. Getting these vaccines out, it's heroic. You already heard Dagfin talk about camels and donkeys, and he's not kidding. People use whatever it takes. And of course, this is the dedicated health workers that are delivering. It's at the end of the day, getting it into her hands at the lowest level so that she can vaccinate that is ultimately going to lead to this, which are healthy children who are in school who are able to learn. So this is ultimately our goal, but we have a lot of difficulties in moving there. Now, we're known for the work we do around child mortality. And, and um, Flavia, of course, reminded us that it's important to think beyond immunization. But what's interesting is that Gavi hasn't only influenced um, uh, MDG4, but also has uh, been engaging with the other MDGs and having an effect on those. And that's an important point because immunization has an effect across not only the entire health system, but across many of the other factors that are important to healthy children. But what about um, going forward now? What about post-2015? So 2015 is an important year. It's the time when our current strategic plan ends. It's also the time when the MDGs end. So what is going to be next? Is it going to be sustainable development goals? 
it's absolutely critical that health remains within whatever the next set of, of development goals are, but it's also critical that we finish the MDGs. So we have a dual task that's in front of us. And I'll talk later about what we're doing at this forum to try to continue that conversation. So one issue, which is not about the health goal, but is about our work, is about what we should do about immunization. This is a short history of immunization in a set of slides. And you can see, in 1984, there was the beginning of the EPI program. At that time, coverage rate was around 5%. We don't have exact figures, but it was quite low in the countries that we're, we're, we're talking about. There were six antigens in that period, and this is what the world was trying to move forward. And you can see over time, I've already showed you this graph, that in fact we've seen a rise in DPT3 coverage, which is the indicator that we use on immunization systems. There have been pushes, and there was a heroic push in 1984 when UNICEF, uh, Task Force for Child Survival, the partners came together for universal childhood immunization. And by 1990, the world was able to get very close to 80% immunization. Another push came when the, um, the, the, the Millennium Development Goals happened, and there, again, there was a push as an immunizations is one of the key indicators. Again, the indicators for these are how to get DTP3 up and measles vaccine. But what's happened since then? Well, there's a whole series of new vaccines, five new antigens I've already shown you. And so when we now move to the Gavi world, Gavi came in, you've already talked about the effect it's had on DTP3. You can see here the curves for um, Hep B and Haemophilus influenza type B. And you can see here as pentavalent vaccine moves in, this rising up. You can also see the new vaccines coming in, Pneumo and Rota. And of course, what we're trying to do, and we're going to discuss here, is how we take those up to that level. So, Today, when we think about what the, what's the 21st century going to look like, we still need to obviously look at DTP3. That's an important indicator. But we're talking about a lot more happening now going forward. This is what WHO now recommends. It's 11 antigens, and they recommend that every child in the world receive these. So the question going forward is, should we be looking at individual antigens or should we be looking at an indicator of the fully immunized child? Because at the end of the day, what we want is every child everywhere to be fully protected by the full contingent of vaccines that can make a difference in their lives. So this is just an idea that we'll be floating to discuss. It's not ready for prime time. We don't have details on the indicator. We haven't figured out how to measure it. But conceptually, this is really where we want to go. And it's interesting, because if we were to do this, today we're around a few percent of fully immunized children. By 2015, maybe we'll be at 10%. By 2030, only around 50% on current projections, and that is certainly not good enough. So the question is, is how do we change this trajectory? If we did this, we would reset, in essence, our aspirations, which I think is what we need to do. Now, of course, one issue is you see on this slide approximately. And a critical issue in the future is not just resetting the indicators, but can we measure it? Often today, I feel like as we're talking about immunization, it's kind of like, you know, we're, we're shooting in the dark against the target because our numbers aren't very tight. We don't have tools that allow us to really understand what's happening. And what we really need is in the future to have indicators that are accurate, measurements in ways that we can really understand what's happening, not only in the immunization, but on the effects on disease. So this is a critical goal for the period going forward. We also need to use better technology. Today, most of our countries are still using paper-based systems, health cards, and yet the world has moved on. Here in Tanzania, I've been told that every Tukul has one cell phone in it and often two or more. So we know there's been this incredible spread of technology. How are we using it? There's been some extraordinary experiments in this area. Project Optimize and others have done that. But why is it that we're not looking, for example, on stock 
so that we can have a map using GIS, and you can see here in a representative fashion, flashing red light, knowing that there's a stock problem in this clinic. And of course today, we have technology that allows to have measurements, RFID chips, that will actually tell where this is. You don't even have to scan it, although that certainly could be an intermediate. So this is not far-fetched. This is what's happening now in most of the world for most of the supply chain, and we just haven't used it yet in immunization. But it isn't only for um, the supply chain. What about for immunization? And again, this is already being tried in many places. Why is it that we don't know which child is missed because they passed their birthday and they haven't come back to the clinic? And why is it we can't use the GIS system to go in and send a health worker to that house to say, what happened to this little child? Is that child healthy? Are there other problems? Did we miss it? That's what we ought to be doing in the future. Now, what about new vaccines? So, um, as you may know, SAGE recommended the in 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 inactivated polio vaccine as a vaccine um, for the world, as one of the um, uh, uh, suggested antigens for the world. The Gavi board will be discussing this as part of our vaccine investment strategy, but this is something that is coming. Cholera vaccine, again, something that will be discussed as part of our investment strategy. Malaria vaccine, we saw some very promising trial results in older children, good moderate protection, and younger children, slightly less protection. And we're still waiting for data on how long the protection will be and, and from WHO and the partners on what the recommendation is to use this. Dengue vaccine. We had a clinical trial that showed good results against three of the four strains. The fourth strain, we saw surprisingly not good results despite having good antibodies. Again, a trial is underway to understand that better. So these are vaccines that are coming along, but there will be others. And the challenge for us, again, is to understand how these play, and if they make a sense, we should make sure that everybody gets them. Of course, it would be remiss for me to not talk about HIV vaccines and TB vaccines. These are vaccines that are very difficult scientifically, perhaps the greatest scientific challenge in vaccinology, but extraordinary progress is being made on these. And so we don't know exactly when that last critical breakthrough is going to occur, but it will occur, I'm absolutely sure of it. And of course, we will welcome these into the armamentarium. What about cancer vaccines? We always talk about non-communicable disease. Cancer, of course, is seen as a non-communicable disease, but it's a little bit of a misnomer because in fact there are cancer vaccines. The first cancer vaccine was hepatitis B. It is actually responsible for most of the future deaths prevented that Gavi has done in its first decade. It's an extraordinary story. It will prevent liver cancer around the world. We're now rolling out human papillomavirus. That, of course, prevents cervical cancer and head and neck cancer and other cancers. So this will, again, be an extraordinary vaccine to prevent cancer. What about others? There are other vaccines that are being made that will prevent cancers. Today it's estimated that about a third of cancers in Africa are caused by known infectious agents. In the, in the entire world, it's a little bit less, maybe 15 to 20 percent. But my prediction is, as we understand the biology better, we'll find out that infections have a huge effect on cancer around the world, and we will be able to prevent it by vaccination, as well as other um, chronic diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and other diseases that probably have an infectious trigger, even diabetes, type 1 diabetes probably does. So at the end, we have all of these amazing vaccines, and you're going to have this, which is a very, very happy health worker, because she's going to be seeing healthy babies and not sick babies. So if we think about um, the, the field of immunization, and we're back to the baobab tree. What is it we need to do? We need to bring together all of the parts of immunization. And of course, critical to that is routine immunization. It's the thing that holds all of it together. These need to be become part of routine immunization. And if we do that, and that's what we all have to discuss doing, and we have to actually make happen in our countries, we will have something extraordinary happen. We will see the flowering of the effort. And for all of you that don't know, baobab trees do flower. It's a rare event. And it is in this season that the baobab trees flower. So if we all come together 
and we work together, maybe we'll see that flowering. So of course, what brings all this together is the amazing partnership that we have. And what's important is not only the core partners, but you saw an extraordinary new group of partners who are stepping up to this challenge, rising to the challenge with us. So we look forward to being with all of you here and to working together to ultimately do what this is about, which is to make sure every child everywhere has access to these vaccines and has a full and wonderful and fulfilled life. Thank you very much.